up on stage, we'll have Dr. Adam Back, the creator of Hashcash, CEO of Blockstream, Cypherpunk OG, and many other things. Please welcome Dr. Adam Back. So, thank you. Um, so, I'm going to talk today about the uh, Bitcoin satellite service that Blockstream has been operating for a couple of years now. And so, a few months back, we expanded the coverage to include more regions. So, I'm going to explain what it does and what, why that's interesting to run as a user or as a Bitcoin business. So, first of all, what it is, it's a set of satellites. There are four satellites and two uplinks, which are sort of uh, base stations that are sending signal, satellite signal up to the satellites, and five transponders. So people sometimes say, make the mistake of thinking there are five satellites. There are actually four. It's just that one of the satellites has two transponders. So it's covering both Asia and Australia from one satellite with two transponders. Um, so this is, this is the, the satellite on the left is Telstar 18V, which was launched by SpaceX uh, late last year. And the service switched over to using that from the previous satellite afterwards. And so what Blockstream is doing is leasing uh, fractional bandwidth on commercial satellites that provide satellite TV service and um, also the industrial use cases and things like that. So you can negotiate with them to lease bandwidth. And that's what we did, leased enough bandwidth to provide the satellite service. Um, the uplinks are actually operated by Blockstream. So we have two uplink sites. And the picture on the right is um, a nine meter dish, which is the uplink for Asia Pacific region. And the user equipment, so the, the whole design is set up to minimize the user equipment cost. So uh, on the left, you can see the um, a normal 45 centimeter, actually, that may be a 60 centimeter dish, and uh, a software defined radio part, which is a USB key, which we'll see in a minute. And the picture on the right is of a ROC 64. So it's a 64. 64-bit uh, ARM, so an ARM64 processor, Raspberry Pi-like board. So that's the kind of minimum specification it takes to run the software. Um, it costs about $40 to buy that kind of equipment, and then you need an external disk drive to store uh, the, the Bitcoin blocks that you've received if you're running a full node. <coughs> so the bit on the left is the software-defined radio. So we're just using it for analog to digital conversion. And the bit on the right is recognizable as the LNB, the part that goes on the end of the arm that collects the satellite signal after it's bounced off the dish. And you may have to swap the dish. You swap the, uh, swap the LNB on the dish you're using if you're reusing an existing satellite TV dish because it's one with particular characteristics. It is used for some other satellite applications, but it may not be the one that, you're, that you were using previously. So more about how it works. Um, the satellites are actually, like, sounds very high tech, satellites in space. But the satellites themselves are relatively uh, dumb pieces of equipment. So they don't do any advanced switching or authentication or digital processing in general. So most of the intelligence is actually on the ground station at the uplink. So our uplink that I showed a picture of is running, uh, you know, redundant power, redundant internet connection, and a Bitcoin full node. And it tries to receive Bitcoin data with very low latency using uh, Matt Corello's fiber protocol. And then it broadcasts the analog encoding of that to the satellite using forward error correction. It retransmits the blocks about four times a day. So that's a way for you to recover if you have a power cut locally, uh, you'll be able to get get fully back online within four to six hours. Uh, so that gives you some capability to withstand temporary outages. And then the signal processing is done on a laptop, or the minimum spec is this ARM64. So now, what, what, is the interest, what are the interesting things you can use the satellite service for? So 
it actually has a number of interesting use cases. So one is even for people with cheap high-speed bandwidth, it has some quite interesting use cases, which is it's a passive broadcast technology. So you can receive this information, and uh, nobody knows you're using it. So your ISP doesn't know you're running a Bitcoin full node. Um, and when you connect to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, other peers on the network see your IP address, and IP addresses are often translatable into your physical street address. So by running a Bitcoin full node, you flag to the peer-to-peer -peer network, and we know there are analysis companies and maybe people with even more nefarious use cases in mind who are watching the Bitcoin network. So it, it protects you from that. It also saves you bandwidth. Running a Bitcoin full node uses more than 10 gigabytes a month. You, you can get it down a bit by disabling relaying and things like that. So you're in receive-only mode. Obviously, with a satellite, you're in receive-only mode anyway. And it reduces costs for the emerging market. So we, we're, we're hoping to get more global Bitcoin access and have more people on a cost basis able to participate fully in the Bitcoin network. And that could be relevant in some countries due to political network disruption. So a few years ago during the Arab Spring, some countries uh, tried to disrupt or turn off internet connections, cell service, and that kind of thing. So during an event like that is a sort of time where having physical gold, the current local currency may be in dis disarray, the economy may be in, in trouble because of disruption. Um, and that's a time where you want hard money, so where you might want uh, gold coins or Bitcoin. And so it uh, provides Bitcoin at a time where infrastructure is disrupted. And as uh, even the internet itself proper without any political dimension can suffer from uh, network disconnections, they're more frequent than people who don't work in specialized network areas realize where, let's say an island country can have uh, some, a fishing boat accidentally break an undersea cable and the whole country can be offline for you know, half a day or a day. And if that were to happen inside a, a bigger area that had significant amount of mining, you might continue to operate thinking that you're processing transactions with finality, but actually be looking at a network split where you're, you're acting on with partial information. And so if that's the smaller hash rate, transactions that you thought were final or actually don't exist on the main Bitcoin network. So the satellite provides a way to bridge that and provide a second fully redundant network connection bridging areas. Um, the satellites, so as I mentioned, there were multiple uplinks, or so two uplinks, and the uplink sites are looking at the neighboring satellite. So if there was a network disruption at one uplink site, it can receive the Bitcoin data from the other uh, satellites. And so that provides kind of cross-satellite redundancy. So they're even using themselves to provide redundancy. Um, so for people who are running Bitcoin businesses where an outage can be expensive, like a big Bitcoin merchant, a Bitcoin exchange, a payment processor, or Bitcoin mining can use this service to have uh, extra resiliency. Um, so we also have a satellite API. So because we had a bit of extra bandwidth, we thought, why don't we make this available for application developers? Now, if you're trying to write applications on, the, on a full node connected to the satellite, you may not have a lot of internet bandwidth uh, or any internet bandwidth. It could be you know, somebody running a kiosk on the side of the road with a generator and just using the satellite service. Um, and how do they know what the current Bitcoin price is, for example? Or is there some application data that they need to operate their application? So the Satellite API gives application programmers who will be building out uh, local use cases like that, uh, building configurations or building software or connecting it to Wi-Fi mesh networks and things like that, a way to send application data. So it's an internet-connected, HTTP REST API that you pay for using Lightning, and the data gets broadcast through the satellite to all of the full nodes that are receiving it, and it just goes in a local directory, and you can run applications and look at it. So, and, and people have just used it just for fun. You know, some people have uh, sent blogs. There's, the screenshot is of uh, the so-called post-Soviet blogger who just started blogging on the satellite uh, when it was in a beta stage. Uh, some months ago. 
And I think there's somebody operating a news site. Uh, so it can be used for all kinds of things. But that raises the question of if you are uh, receiving the bulk transactions from the satellite, and the satellite is sending first the transactions and then the compact blocks, so you get both the transactions that are pending and then the blocks confirming that they are processed. So how would you go about sending a transaction? So the key observation is that transactions are small, 250 bytes per transaction. So even if you have an expensive type of internet connection, um, it doesn't cost very much on a per transaction basis to send an individual transaction. So even a, you know, $10 a megabyte or something, which you might get on some kind of fancy uh, satellite bidirectional data device like the one shown at the top right, sending an individual transaction will probably only cost you a few cents. Particularly if you can share it in a, an emerging market, you could share it between many users. Uh, the other device on the left is another higher speed. So the, the device on the top right is quite slow. It's like a 2400 board uh, bidirectional internet battery powered MiFi device that uses the Iridium satellite uh, radio. The one at the bottom left is a higher speed, 384 kilobits. Uh, there is also an SMS gateway mentioned there and uh, mesh networks. So we're going to be talking, other, other speakers are going to talk about those. So what's next? So we're going to just improve various aspects of it. So a bigger retransmit window so you can withstand longer downtimes and not have to be as recently caught up in terms of the blocks you're, you have available. Um, there's a small coverage gap over Eastern Europe. We're interested to fill that in to lower the equipment cost and to make available kits to buy. Today you can follow instructions and buy the parts yourself, but we will look to make a kit available and to make it easier to use and uh, look for more third-party developers to build out use cases in emerging markets and other applications. So that's it.